thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I just love it to hear a little bit about um, kind of the work you're doing and what you're doing here at Stanford. Yeah, so um, my work uh, kind of uh, dovetails into a lot of what you're seeing in the popular media about artificial intelligence and medical imaging in, in particular. Um, I'm currently the associate director of the Amy Center, which is the Artificial Intelligence and Medicine and Imaging Center here at Stanford. Uh, that's uh, founded and run mainly by Kurt Langlotz. And uh, we have collaborations all over the campus in the computer science department, electrical engineering, and others. And, you know, one of the things that we try to do is look for projects that are um, uh, high impact, that can be translated into the clinic as, uh, as soon as possible, and give us the opportunity to evaluate those in actual practice here at Stanford. Um, we believe we're the best position in the world with a, an amazing computer science and, and um, you know, world-class medical institution together to really move this science forward fast. And so could you talk a little bit about the inception? How did this idea come out? I understand it's a new center. Just what was that process like? Yeah, you know, so what we found was that, you know, as we kept doing project after project and um, were getting a lot of momentum, it turned out that um, there were more and more people interested. And I think that the first question is, uh, from most clinicians, is how can I get involved? Um, because I really want to, you know, be a part of this. Um, and from the computer science side, or usually the basic science side, the question is, is how do I get in touch with a clinician who's interested in working with me? And so it, it, it kind of, I think, began as kind of a matchmaking, setting up teams. Got it. Um, because we know that as much as there are clinicians that have some computer science expertise, and certainly there are some computer scientists that have done quite a bit of you know, medical research, um, you still need both to really have a successful project. And, and you have stakeholders that can kind of see the project through. And so we fig figured that the center would be a wonderful way to, uh, to support that relationship and to you know, support those projects as, they, again, they moved into what will essentially be a clinical trials program uh, of these technologies in, directly in patient care. And one thing I've seen a lot with informatics research is kind of that gap between basic science research and clinical care. Can you talk about how you're hoping to make that transition work? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult in a lot of parts of medicine to truly um, fulfill the promises of the bench to bedside, right? You hear that a lot. Um, but this is one of the things that makes us so excited to be a part of this. This is one of the first projects I've been a part of, and I've been doing medical research for over a decade, that the promise of bench to bedside can actually be fulfilled. So to give you an example, we, um, over the course of the fall of last year, we developed an algorithm that could look at the hand of a child, x-ray of the hand of a child, and determine the age of that child, which is an important task for pediatric radiology, one of the first things we ever did. And you know, we published on that, and we did all the things that academics do, talk about it, try to refine it, um, but, um, but that's usually where things end. As you probably know, um, it takes a lot longer to get those things in front of uh, clinicians for patient care, but um, we were able to do that in two months. And, and right now you have that algorithm currently working in the background in clinical practice now here at Stanford Hospital, providing the output of what that model believes that x-ray happens to demonstrate to the expert radiologist while they're practicing in the clinical care. And um, that was a great use case because it's a small, relatively low volume kind of a problem. Um, and because it's gone so well, we've now ramped up to chest x-rays, we're moving on to bone x-rays. So we're really seeing these things go directly into practice, which to be honest with you is, is what has given us so much more momentum in the latter half. Because as, as I've said, um, clinicians lose enthusiasm when they don't see the things that they've been working so hard on actually impact patient care. Right. And has there been any pushback as you've gone into the hospital? Has there been any you know, kind of questioning of the algorithm? How does this work? Explaining deep learning to a physician. Absolutely. So, all those are all those things come up all the time. Um, I think that I I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call it pushback. There's a lot of curiosity. There's a lot of um, confusion. I think a lot of the things that we tend to do. Another purpose of the center is to provide sort of an educational opportunity to clinicians and computer scientists, frankly, who are. Uh, maybe coming with a, a conception that's wrong, a preconceived notion about how this is supposed to work. Um, for the clinical implementation, we've had nothing but open arms, but this is Stanford, right? So this is right, a place right. that we, um, I think we all participate in the culture and the community of uh, wanting to do new things and being a part of that. Hiccups that can occur 
um, are mainly centered around uh, something you just alluded to, which is how does it work? Um, and, that's, and that's been some, one of the criticisms for deep learning or artificial intelligence for many years, and this has been going on for decades, right? Um, but one of the newer techniques that we've been able to exploit in some of the work that we're doing in clinical medicine is that um, even though it's considered a black box, we can kind of reverse engineer what the model was looking at to make the decision. And that's become a critical piece to, um, to get buy-in from the clinicians because we're visual doctors. We look at images all day long. That's our job. Um, and we know why we are calling, for example, something a fracture. We know where that fracture is. When the model says it's a fracture, I would like to know, and I'm sure everyone else would, is it looking at the fracture or is there something else? Right. There's two reasons for that question. One is you want to feel comfortable that it's making the right decision for the right purpose. But the second thing is actually more interesting. What we find occasionally is that the model um, picks up on something that we didn't expect it to look at to right. make a decision. And in the case of pathology, there have been reports that, um, that they've actually changed clinical practice mm -hmm. because of something the model discovered in the act of uh, interpreting a, an image. So that is really the cool exploratory components of some of the things that we're doing. And I think that once you have had that conversation with your clinician partners and say, we're going to work on this together. Everyone's a part of this. Um, and we may actually be able to help patients by discovering a new way to do this type of a test. Um, I think it's very easy to get buy-in. And so it sounds like there's the focus on the basic research implementation at Stanford. Are you thinking about how this really carries on to the broader community? How, do you, how it goes from pilot at Stanford and the Children's Hospital to surrounding hospitals? Yeah, so one of my personal passions is in uh, global health, and I, I served as a, a vice uh, president uh, for a large global health organization that was focused on imaging, which is now the largest in the world called RADAID. And in that process, we wrote a textbook on global health imaging, and we've kind of learned a lot about pitfalls and opportunities around the world in different situations. And when this research kind of started to really catch on, um, what immediately occurred to myself and those of us in this community uh, was that you know this technology is terrific and I hope that we are able to help patients here at Stanford but um, if you think about it patients at Stanford there's always a radiologist around right. to help but two-thirds of the world's population more than four billion people there's no radiologist around and that's a staggering number of people that have the same illnesses and have the same causes of death that we do and they desperately need medical imaging, and even more than the equipment, they need the expertise to do right. it correctly. Right. And what AI could potentially present is a very low cost way to transport the, the, the combined medical knowledge and expertise here and other centers around the US and Europe, and bring that directly to the point of care in any part of the world that you, that you want. And, um, and so I've shared this vision with um, Professor Andrew Eng, you may know from the Computer Science Department, and our labs have kind of combined to work um, extremely hard on massive scale deployment of these algorithms that we're validating. So if I can get a clinically validated algorithm in the hands of every practitioner around the world who would potentially use it or need it, I would consider that a big impact and a big win. And again, not having to add the extra layer of cost right, onto right. that, which is what AI can potentially do for us. Right. So that's, that's, where my, that's where my passion is. And how long, how far away is that, that vision? We have, uh, we have a pilot right now going on in Tanzania. I expect to have something usable by the end of the year. Wow. Yeah, it's wow. fast, yeah. And kind of what has been the kind of global reception of that? Is this absolutely we want it again is there that same concern how does it work with government how does it work with regulation yeah there, there, there's no certainly no short or easy answer to that and I think it's it's just like with everything else it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis but one of the things that um, make this makes this different is that we don't hold all the cards per se so what I mean by that is rather than say well here's this new imaging modality but I'm the only one who knows how to to use it and I have to show you and you know I have I'm in charge mm -hmm. that is not, we're reversing that concept where we're saying, here is a tool that is free. Mm -hmm. You, meaning anyone, I don't care where you are, mm -hmm. can choose to use this however you see fit. Mm -hmm. And whether you find value in it, great. Whether you think it needs to be changed in some way, great. 
That's mm -hmm. the court of public peer review. Got and it. the opportunities to make those changes, again, unlike some other technologies, is, is actually fairly, fairly easy. Um, and, and so we're really hoping to see if we can validate these things to the point where we are comfortable that they're safe and certainly effective for the things that we're claiming that they're effective for. Then it's up to the world to decide the value and the use cases. Because again, just like with the models that we worked with, I think we'll be surprised at who uses this, what they're using it for, and I hope that it's for the betterment of everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and what about your, your colleagues here at Stanford or your fellow radiologists? What is, I know there's kind of community concern, people talking about jobs, the future, myself as a medical student, what does that look like in 10, 20 years? What do you see from that picture? You know, there have been a lot of opinion pieces and editorials written about the future of radiology. Does this mean the end mm -hmm. of radiology? And I think that from a very superficial viewpoint, you can draw those conclusions because you're seeing models, deep learning models or artificial intelligence, that can perform some of the tasks that, that we do as radiologists. Um, but I think that um, one of the reasons that that narrative has not really caught on in the radiology community um, that does the research at least, is that when you really are in the weeds and you understand fundamentally the complexities of the job that we do, mm -hmm. um, and you hold that against the, the complexities of, the, of the, the jobs that we're asking the models to do, there's still a big gap. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, do I think in 10 years things will be, of course, things are gonna right. be different. Um, but, but as it stands now, you know, um, we have tried to not focus as much on our own specialty as, um, as, as we have tried to focus on how can we help the patients that we're serving. Right. Because if it means that someone can come to the emergency room in a rural part of the country or the world and receive the proper treatment and not have to either wait for a radiologist, find a radiologist, or potentially be misdiagnosed, then you know, it sort of changes for me the stakes mm -hmm. and makes that maybe a more important goal than to sort of fret and worry about who's going to regulate, who's going to control, right. um, how am I going to get reimbursed, is my job safe? But what I tell medical students, and this is important because there has been some concern amongst medical students, I think that there is no better field to harness some of the transformative technologies in the future than radiology. And I'm talking mm -hmm. just outside of this kind of work, I'm talking about virtual reality, I'm talking about the opportunity to hybridize with surgery mm -hmm. in ways that we never thought possible. Um, we're seeing advances here, and I'm certain in other labs across the country, um, where radiology is the centerpiece of some of the most amazing medical tech that's coming out. So I would jump into radiology in a heartbeat again, mm -hmm. knowing everything that I know now about the research. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, glad to have you here. My pleasure. Thank you so much.